If you don't have a sermon outline, please lift your hand, and these guys will be glad to give one to you. Maybe you slipped in without getting one. Just hold up your hand. Let them, let them get to you. This morning we come to a glorious passage of Scripture that um, is really central to, gos- to the gospel of Mark. I have a question for you. Have you ever got into a situation where you are looking at a circumstance and exactly what you feel compelled to do is the wrong thing. It, it, it seems like the right thing to do, but it's the wrong thing. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples of this. You're cooking along, good old southern fried chicken on the stove. The grease gets too hot, and the old flame of the propane gas or whatever flips around on the other side of the pan and ignites the grease. You have a grease fire. Has anybody here ever had a grease fire camping or in the kitchen or something like that? You had one, bringing back bad memories, PTSD. Sorry about that. Edward is over here if you need to see him afterwards. Okay. But what do you not do when you have a grease fire? You don't throw water on it. That makes a bad situation worse. Okay, you're driving along in the snow and ice. You're cruising along, seeking to be careful, but suddenly the vehicle starts to turn to the right. And the vehicle starts to just turn to the right, and you feel every inclination to do what? To do two things. You want to hit the brakes, and you want to turn the opposite way. But if, you're a good, if you've been well-trained in driving, you know that when a vehicle starts to turn, braking traction, you turn in with the turn and regain control, regain con- traction while not putting on the brakes. This, this is just the opposite of what we want to do. Now, I'm a scuba diver. I enjoy diving. Just a couple of weeks ago, Cheryl and I went diving. And um, when, you're a, when you're scuba diving, one of the things that they train you to do, which you simply must learn to do, is that if you have to make an emergency ascent to the surface, the one thing that you do not do while you are making an emergency ascent is hold your breath. If you hold your breath while you make an emergency ascent, you most assuredly will die. And it's because your lungs with compressed air at the bottom underneath the weight of the water, as you go up, the pressure becomes less and your lungs get larger. And so your lungs will continue to get larger and larger. And if you don't let air out of them, they will burst your lung. They will burst under the expanding pressure that is there. It, it is completely counterintuitive to be out of air and be heading for the surface. That actually happened to me when I was 18 years old, diving a wreck called the Mercedes wreck off of Fort Lauderdale. Through a series of events, I ran out of air. I was with my dad, the Boy Scout of all Boy Scouts. And so, it, you know, normally this wouldn't happen, but there were some weird things that happened, and I dove with the reserve valve open, I used the air, I was out of air at 100 feet, and I made an emergency ascent, and I survived it because of training. It was against everything in me to let out the air. You're, you're trained to go as you head for the surface, letting air steadily out as it grows in your lungs. It goes against everything in you. Well, there is something that goes against everything in us in this passage. In the Gospel of Mark, the Lord Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he is teaching them the counterintuitive ways of God compared to our fallen thinking and our fallen mentality. Our fallen thinking and mentality is counter, it's countered against the ways of God over and over and over again. And this isn't on your outline, but let me just give you a few of them. 
These, there's many of these in Scripture that you can see. But one of the counterintuitive realities in God's real world, God's real world, as opposed to the facade of this present life, is number one, that the humble are first in line. The humble are simply first in line. Now, this isn't on your outline, but this is just for free. The humble are first in line. Jesus says it's not the prideful, it's not the boastful, it's not the pushy that go first when it comes to God. It's the humble in the things that truly matter. Number two, unlike the world in the kingdom of God, the rich have no advantage over the poor. In the economy of God and in the grand scheme of God's reality, the rich have no advantage over the poor. Now, in this earthly life, there's no question that the rich have an advantage over the poor. And I'm not just talking about Bill Gates and, you know, the, the mega million, millionaires. I'm talking about America in comparison to the rest of the world, as so to speak. Or even here in this room that there's some who have much more than others. And praise God that the, the closer we come to the reality of God, hopefully through His Word and His love being played out in our hearts, that there's, that there's no advantage of the rich over the poor, even in a church that honors God in His economy of scale. But that's, that's a second one. A third one is this. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 17, we find that if you do not receive the kingdom of God as a child you cannot enter it. Now, there are most things in life that you can't do it until you're an adult. There are a lot of restrictions about the fact that if you don't have age, if you don't have maturity, if you don't have stature, I mean, you go and it says 42 inches, you got to be at least this or higher in order to ride this ride or be able to drive this thing or be able to do this or do that. There are many, many things that require experience and that require age and all of these things. But when we come to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is saying the simplicity of simple faith, like the faith of a child in a parent, is what is required to enter his kingdom. Amen. That, is, that is counterintuitive. You would think, oh, it's the people who have really studied the holy writings of God, and it's the people who have gone through all of the processes and all of the religiosity. Those have to have a higher standing and a better standing with God. But we find Oh no, the issue is the matter of the heart, and the issue of the matter of the heart, and even the submitted intellect is that of a child. Number four, one of the other things that we, that we find so counterintuitive is this, is that the most costly thing that you could ever possess, the most costly thing that could ever be yours is free. The most valuable thing that you could ever hope for, the, the, most, the most beautiful and rare when it comes to the, the faculties of earth and the faculties of man that could be available to you is completely and totally free in Christ Jesus. That is salvation in Christ that comes not because of anything that we bring. The Bible says, come, he who has money, come and buy. Now, the picture is, is that Christ has made it free. He has paid for it. Amen. The last one that I'll share with you is this. The reason that the most costly thing that you could ever have is free is because what you believe to be your good deeds, what you believe to be your good deeds, will never, nor can they ever, overcome your bad deeds. What you believe to be your good deeds, they will never overcome your bad deeds. That is counterintuitive. The way man thinks and the way the world thinks is if you mess up, then you have to overcome your mess up. You have to pay off the debt. You have to come and bring uh, value back to compensate for this. And the truth of God's word, the truth of his living word is this, that in Christ Jesus, our best that we have to offer is not anywhere near good enough. It is only through the costly sacrifice of Christ. And so, counterintuitive 
to our fallen thinking is this passage that that Stephen has already read for us this morning, and I want to read it briefly again and let you get get the thrill of this passage and start to see that Jesus is setting it up so that not only his disciples back 2,000 years ago, but his disciples sitting in this room can begin to see that his great mission is our mission. And he intends from the start, listen to this, to share it with us, to share his mission with us, that we would share in his mission to come and to seek and to save that which is lost. Look what it says there in verse 35. And James and John, so these are brothers, the sons of Zebedee. The Bible also says that they were called the sons of thunder. Uh, Now, why were they called the sons of thunder? We don't really know. We would think that they were boisterous, that they were rough, that they were tough, that they would speak their mind. In fact, James would be the first apostle to be martyred. Stephen was the first Christian, but James was the first apostle to be martyred. All of them would be martyred martyred except for John. But we find that John would go from being the youngest disciple, not necessarily um, uh, so so very meek, not the meekest disciple, not necessarily the the disciple with the most humility or, or something along those lines. He is called the beloved. He calls himself the beloved in order to bring us to understanding that he was there with Jesus by his side in so many different circumstances. But he was the youngest, but apparently he lived the longest after the life of Christ of any of the apostles. He would write five books of your New Testament. What are the five books that John would write? He would write the Gospel of John, and then he would write three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So those are letters, so the Gospel plus three letters. And then what's the last book that John would write? Revelation. Monumentally important part of your New Testament. All of it is important, but the, the beautiful picture of Revelation and the great power that we see in the things that are to come, in the great glory of God's judgment, and the great glory of his grace being played out into the final state, we we see that John is the one that would be in the midst of all of that. But these two guys didn't start off ready to go to death, and they didn't start off ready to write some of the most poetic and beautiful parts of God's revelation to us. They were called the sons of thunder for a reason. Now, we would see here as well that these guys had a real problem with pride. And it was helped by their mother. Um, She also was campaigning for them. But notice what it says here in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us what we ask for you. Now, what does that sound like? We want you to do what we're going to ask. Have you ever had somebody come up that pushy? I mean, maybe, maybe this is part of their, their unabashed selves that come up and say, here's our demand. We want you to do what we ask. And then what they ask is not, would you please, you know, take our money and give it to the poor? That's not what they came up saying. Please do this. They came up and they said something just the opposite. Look at verse 36. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus being so patient. Verse 37, and they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, that's very humble, isn't it? Look at verse 38. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Verse 39, look what they confidently say. We are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those from whom, for whom it has been prepared. Now, Jesus, as he so often does, is flipping the human thinking and the human economy and the fallen ways right on their head, flipping them completely over because God's ways are not our ways and our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Here we see Jesus flipping it around. 
In fact, many commentators would say this, that in verse 39 and in verse 40, Jesus is saying, this cup that I'm going to drink, when did Jesus bring up the cup? when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane about to go to the cross, and he said, Father, if it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. Let me not drink this cup. Let me not take what is about to come. And then this baptism, we learn also in the Scripture that Jesus is talking about a baptism into death, a baptism that goes through death that would come into life. And John and James are going to drink the cup, and they are going to participate in his cup and in his baptism, but in a way that they never dreamed because they didn't know what was coming in the future. Now, so they didn't understand verse 39 and verse 40 necessarily. I really don't believe at the time. I think later it would become completely clear to them. In fact, in verse 40 where it says, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has, for whom it has been prepared. Jesus is believed to be talking about the two thieves on either side of the cross. You see, because in Jesus, listen to this, in Jesus' economy of scale, in Jesus' values, going to the cross is his glory. This is the great glory of God, that God would come and show his love by dying in the place of sinners for sinners so they can be saved. This is the grand glory. This is why his wounds when we get to heaven will still be visible because his wounds represent the glory of his love and the glory of his grace, the glory of judgment and the glory of rescue. And so God comes and he says to them, you have no idea about the cup that is about to be given or or that I'm about to drink or the baptism and what you're asking to be at my left and be at my right is not mine to grant. Because the Father has already determined this. And they, I don't believe at the time, had any idea what he was saying. Look at verse 41. And when they heard, and when the ten heard it, so you remember there's 12 disciples. So these two are campaigning to be on the right and on the left of Jesus's Jesus's, uh, throne. And and, in verse 41 it says, and when the ten heard it, they were indignant at James and John. And say, yeah, me too, okay? I would be too. Look at verse 42. And Jesus called to them and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of of the Gentiles lord it over them. This is the way of the world. This is how they do it. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Verse 43. But it shall not be so among you. Can you underline that? But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And then verse 45 is the crux of it, perhaps one of the most important sentences in all of the Gospel of John. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, unfortunately, many of us have heard these verses taught from a moralistic point of view in our modern society. The the real The real text here, and especially verses 35 through 44, is all about you need to be more humble, and you need to be a servant. That very often is is the, the way that these passages are taught, that Christians need to be more like Jesus in this way. And I, and I think that it's completely true that we need to be more servant-minded. It's completely true that we need to be more humble, and we need to recognize that. But I think something much grander is going on here. 
And I believe that if we really understand the greatness of God's glory and the greatness of his judgment and what he's going to do with sin and where his glory really is in the cross, that we would begin to take in verse 45 in the context of the, of the nine or ten verses that are ahead of it. That we would begin to see that this is the glory of the gospel and that God intends that we would be like Jesus in this, holding on to the true nature of his grace through his sacrifice. So, number one, I want you to just quickly write these things down, and then we're going to pray together as groups in just a moment as we, as we take in this passage and as we apply it to our calling and missions. Look at verse one, or number one here. In almost every way, the kingdom of God has an upside-down perspective in comparison to the kingdom of man. In almost every way, we see that. And we see this here. We see this here not only in, in Jesus clarifying that it is, it is the humble that are exalted and that it is the humble who come and who rule and reign with him, but we see it most poignantly in the fact that Jesus is the center of this perspective. Why would the creator God of all things lay down his life? You see, and notice this, I put this in parentheses underneath, meekness, your humility, meekness, self-sacrifice, and real love versus the poisonous peas, versus pride, power, position, and prestige. Those are the poisonous peas of humanity. Those are the things that bring about a selfishness that is not of God. And here we begin to see that God's way is very, very different than man's way in his fallenness. Look at number two. We also see in verses 35 through 7, we can be grossly mistaken about the realities of God's kingdom. I mean, here were two of the disciples here are James and John, very close to the Lord Jesus. And they couldn't be more wrong. Just like the guy or the gal that's standing in front of a grease fire and there and goes and gets a bucket of water. He couldn't be more wrong. She couldn't be more wrong. The diver whose emergencies ascent and think, oh, I hope I can hold my breath into the surface. Couldn't be more wrong and deadly. And here we see that James and John couldn't be more wrong about what they're asking. Let me sit on your right and let one of us sit on your left. Let us be known for being so great with you. Isaiah 55 is so very beautiful. In verses 8 through 9, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the un unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now listen to this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Verse 9 says, for as the high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, the point of this is not that you can never understand God's thoughts. The point of this is that God is saying my ways are very different than your ways. And we see this in John, James and John being vividly used by God to show us his upside down priorities from human existence. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 and 16 and verse 25 say essentially the same thing. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it is the way of death. So there's a way that seems like this is the way it should work. This is the way it should go, but it ends in destruction. And so when we, when we you know, we have the advantage of being 2,000 years after James and John. We can read this passage and we go, yeah, can you believe James and John? They're so stupid. Why would they say that? Can you, but they ought to know better. Well, you know, the reason we may know any better is because they st stuck their mouth in their foot, or excuse me, stuck their foot in their mouth <laughs> in the process of things. And, and we, we begin to see that fallen thinking will cause you to say and do 
stupid things. So, so notice this and fill this in. If you're new to us, we've been saying this for years. Let's say it out loud, everybody. Sin will make you stupid. This is one of the few times kids you can use the word stupid. Sin will make you stupid. It will make you do stupid things that not only hurt you, but hurt those around you. It will make you do stupid things that causes you to be known for the fool that your fallen heart is. Our, our hearts are prone toward foolishness without the redemption and the rescue of God in His ways, being higher than our ways. You know, when we, when we look at somebody struggling deep with sin, you don't just sit there and go, yep, sin will make you stupid. I mean, we, we, we recognize that for ourselves, but we run to them and we seek to help them out of this great place of frustration and pain and difficulty where they are because God's ways are better than our ways. So, number one, in almost every way, God's kingdom is upside down to comparison of man. Number two, we can be grossly mistaken about the realities of God's kingdom. Number three, I love this one. Number three, Jesus is a patient teacher. I have often said to you, my brother has had a big impact on my life. When I was in college and seeking to walk with the Lord and talking on the phone from Tallahassee to, Georgia, to Atlanta, Georgia, where he was in, in school and I was in school. And I remember talking to him one night about just frustrations in the Christian life and trying to make it, trying to, to honor the Lord. And I just remember him saying these words to me. He said, Andrew, you have to remember that God is a patient teacher. He's a patient teacher with you. And that wasn't a license to sin. That wasn't a license to feel good about my own failures. But it was this. It was a statement of grace. It was the statement of God's grace towards us that he comes and he, and he works with us and he moves in us and, he's, and he's, he's constantly turning us to him and growing us. Because if he wasn't a patient teacher, there would be no hope, for, certainly for the likes of me. Look what it says in number three. Jesus is a patient teacher who will graciously walk his true followers through discovery and identification with who he really is. And that's what we see happening in this passage. You see it in verse 36. Now tell me, I mean, would you have stood there and said, what do you want me to do for you? When they come up and say, we want you to do something for us. Jesus says, well, what would you like me to do? I believe he's being very patient because he already knows what's going to come out of their mouths. But yet the eternal creator God who knows their thoughts better than they know themselves says, what do you want me to do for you? And then their obnoxious request, verse 37, grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left. And then in verse 38 and 39, he gently begins to bring them along. He says, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized in what I'm about to be baptized is baptized into death? He's saying, you will. You will. But to be granted for you to be on either side of me in my glory, they're not even ready to understand what that really means yet. He's being so patient. He's being so gentle. And later, as time would come, they would come to discover what he was saying. They would come to discover who he really is. They would come to discover, and not only to discover it, but we see later in this text that they are going to join him in this. They're not only going to go to the death of themselves in this earthly life, not even talking about a physical death necessarily at first, as it is talking about the being dead to sin and dead to their own fleshly in, impulsive and, and, and heinous nature of, of anti-God thinking, that they would, they would be transformed by his gospel, transformed by his grace, and discovering who he really is and what he was really doing, and then they would themselves come to identify with who he really is by spending the rest of their lives, even unto death in torture, identifying themselves with his message and his mission. And that's what brings us to number four. Look at number four. Jesus 
in this, the reigning king, the reigning king who was the creator of all things that ever was, that ever have been, becomes the suffering servant. I mean, this is counterintuitive. If you created the world, why would you let the world torture you and string you up to be accursed, to be mocked? But this is the love of God. Jesus, the reigning king, becomes the suffering servant as he lays down his life, and we see this in verse 45, to rescue by ransom, to rescue by ransom his true followers. You know, there's a couple of different ways that you can rescue. If you've ever watched Entebbe, the, the film on the rescue of the Olympic player or, or of the people that were taken to, to Africa and being held. If you ever saw the Iranian hostage um, rescue, if you ever saw some of these other things that, that, that were attempts to rescue, you know, you can rescue by force. You can, you can come and you can rescue in obliterating all of your enemies. Or in another way that you come and rescue is to pay off what is required. And here we see that Jesus comes in his grandness and in his glory and in his grace so that we might understand his love and the depth of his resolve for us. He comes and lays down his life in exchange for ours. This is the amazing rescue. This is rescue, as this passage says, by ransom. That he comes and pays our debt, having nailed it to a tree. And it was the tree of his own suffering. This is how much God loves you. This is the gospel for you. All the things that you've ever done against God, harming the glory and the beauty of who he is by your foolish behavior. He comes to pay the price, to pay the debt, to pay the ransom. Now, friends, this is what a world desperately needs to hear. This is, what, this is the, the message that God has told us to share with a lost and dying world that so desperately needs to know that there is a God of love who will forgive and give grace. He's told us to participate with him in this. Here's the key concept. In verses 39, through 43, or verses 39 and 43, we see this. These verses reveal that our identification with Jesus in his salvation assumes our identification in his mission. This is just one of those, there's many places where we see this in the scripture, but this is just another one of those great commission passages where we see the great commission seeping through. Don't turn it over yet. We're, we're, I want you to see this. Look at verse 39 and what it says. And it says, and they said to him, we are able. And look at the rest of verse 39. He says, and he said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. Jesus knew what John and James were going to do. He knew that they were going to come and identify with him in his death. And with the baptism which with I am baptized, you will be baptized. He knew that by faith that they were going to identify with his death on the cross, that they were going to trust in his death on the cross. He knew that they were going to come to an understanding and a faith of this. But he also says here in verse 43, look what it says in verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. You see, he's saying, you are going to be with me in this. You are going to have the servanthood of me with this. You are going to embrace my way instead of your way. He says, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and who will ever be first among you must be a slave for all, for even the Son of Man has not come didn't, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. He is showing us that through identification with his salvation, they are going to embrace his mission life. Now, this is a key point for us because of this. There are many Christians who do not realize that their salvation actually implicates them without question in his mission. 
You see, if you're a Christian, you are called to be a missionary. You are called to be a speaker of the gospel. You are called to be one who shows and shares the gospel, that the gospel is on your lips and it's in your hands. It's the way that you work. You see, it's not optional that Christians would represent Christ in a fallen world. That is not, op- that is not assumed as optional. Here we see that God is calling all throughout the ages that identify with him to identify with the great commission that he gives to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that he has commanded. If you're a Christian, you're called to embrace his great commission. Now, safely, you can flip your sheet. I want you to see this at the, at the back end. You'll notice that there's the prayer request there from last week. They're already filled in, but I want you to just notice a couple of things here before we pray together. Look at verse 17, John chapter 17 and verse 18. Here's Jesus speaking to the Father. He's praying to the Father. It's called the the high priestly prayer. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Underline that. You see, the Father sent Jesus into the world on mission to rescue the world. And Jesus sent us into the world to proclaim the rescue has been paid for. That we are being sent into the world to be the salt and the light, the preservative and the taste of the world that they would come to know and taste and see that the Lord is good. This is our calling. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 20 and 21. It says, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. You see, this is in his, after his resurrection. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And let's read this underlined portion out loud together. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Friends, if you're a Christian, you are called, you are sent as a result of your calling to preach the gospel. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 24. We talked about the apostle Paul last week, went through all of his his calling on the people that were supporting him to pray for the mission, to join them in mission work. And look look at Paul's statement here, identifying his life with Christ. Look what it says, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, and underline this, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. You see, that is the mission of Paul, because he is a follower of the Lord Jesus, called out to preach the gospel. There is a general call to all Christians to fulfill the great commission. We are called to be salt and light. We are called to speak the name of the gospel. There's no doubt there is the special call of of those who are set aside to preach the gospel, leading in a group, leading the life of the church, or leading as missionaries, blazing new trails of the gospel. There's no doubt that that there's a unique calling in that. But we as a church need to recognize the general call that we as Christians have been given. Now, I want you to just notice here with me, remember this from last week, the Apostle Paul, what was he? He was a missionary, a preacher, a teacher, a church planter, a pastor, a discipler. And where did he go? He went all over the Mediterranean world, over and over and over again, walking 10,000 miles by foot, sailing 6,000 miles by ship. He spent hundreds of days traveling, going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we recognize that just as Paul was calling on the local church to pray for them, That as we send out a team to southern France to witness to Muslims, as we send out a team uh, to another country in Europe to take care of missionary kids, that this is all part of the grand picture 
of preaching the gospel to the last places of the earth. And so here this morning, we not only see that we pray for them, but we recognize that Christ's mission is our mission, or our mission is Christ's mission. The great picture of this, last week we said, they go, we go in prayer. Last week, we gathered around them here in the front of this place, and we prayed for them. And those prayers are already being answered. We, we see God just already hearing just how he's preparing their hearts. All the ministry starts tomorrow. I mean, some of them are being trained in southern France today. The, the folks that are going to be going out to the port gates over the next couple of days. And, and the other thing, the, all the families are, that are missionary families for the other team, they're all arriving today. I mean, Pastor Ben and Chuck Samarius went and they bought, I don't know how many gallons of ice cream, because it, it, here's the first time when they're all together, they're bringing all the MKs together, all the missionary kids together, and they are going to spend a, a lot of time getting to know them and seeking to help them have the experience that many of our kids here grew up with. But there, they don't get to have that experience. They don't have a nice big church that they go to. They live, we, we have kids that are living in remote places that hard, they don't know any other Christians that are their age, that are in their circumstance, that are from their culture. And so what this ministry does this week, both in both contexts, is a very important context. We have been called to pray. We have been called to pray and to um, ask God to do a grand and glorious thing. I want to encourage you this morning to be looking at this list of prayer items that are here. I want to...